So, yeah, so uh, today I will be discussing uh, a bioenergetics model for, for Baltic herring that we updated and its role as a tool to be able to help quantify herring's role in the Baltic ecosystem. And so before we get started, just want to discuss a little bit about what is bioenergetics. And bioenergetics is the study of the processing, of, excuse me, energy by living systems. And I want to bring highlight to the term energy because whenever we talk about energy, we need to think about uh, thermodynamics. We're governed by thermodynamics. And uh, specifically in the case of bioenergetics, uh, the first law of thermodynamics is really important. So matter cannot be created nor destroyed, only changed from, from one form to another. And so basically our ins, what goes into the system, has to come out one way or another. And so what does that look like when we try to model a biological system? Well, it looks like this mass balance equation that you see on the top. Uh, consumed energy equals metabolism plus waste and growth. And as you can imagine, this is really a simplification of reality. There's a lot of biochemical uh, things and, and different effects that can change these, how much energy goes into each one of these outputs. And so when we're modeling bioenergetics, uh, how well our models perform really depends on our appropriate parameterization, our, our mathematical parameterization of, of these different things that go into our mass balance equation. And so when uh, we're working with a bioenergetics model for herring, what does that look like? Well, this is the, the, the mass balance equation here, right? Our consumption is what goes into the system. That's what the herring eat. And that needs to be balanced by uh, their metabolism. And so metabolism is everything in blue. So they can be broken down to a few different parts. You have respiration, just the general respiration term. That is the basal metabolism, uh, what is necessary energetically for the fish to keep itself alive. You have active metabolism. And so that is the active cost uh, of uh, swimming, for example, and then specific dynamic action, which is the energy needed uh, to digest food. And so that's metabolism. Also, you have uh, outputs in forms of waste, and solid waste is excretion, uh, undigested food. And you also have the excretion of uh, cellular byproducts like nitrogenous waste and things like that. And that finds itself coming into play in the egestion term. And anything, any energy that's consumed but not used in metabolism or expelled as waste is usually uh, used for uh, adding biomass or growth, right? That energy is, is stored in their body. So what's really cool about bioenergetics models is you can rearrange them. Um, and if you know uh, three of these terms, for example, you can figure out the rest. And so a common application of bioenergetics models is we, if we know consumption, the respiration of the fish, excuse me, and how much waste they excrete, we can uh, model growth and vice versa. We can model consumption. We can model how much nitrogen or phosphorus, for example, they release in their waste. And this has a lot of impacts when you're trying to figure out ecosystem, uh, investigate ecosystem level functions. And so the first model for Baltic herring came right here from Stockholm University, uh, Lars Rostam, in 1988. And it looks complicated. These are all of the uh, mathematical parameters that go into the model, usually derived from lab experiments and things like that, uh, usually fish-specific. Um, uh, but ignore those. Pay attention to the different equations that are highlighted here, right? Uh, same colors as the last slide. Consumption equation in red respiration equations in blue, and the waste equations, excretion and ingestion in brown. And so what data do we need, do we need to start these models to, to, to start trying to investigate some questions using these bioenergetics models? Well, if you look at the equations, right, a lot of them mo are functions of weight, W, and temperature. For example, respiration is weight, temperature, and U, which ends up swim to be swimming speed. Swimming speed also dependent on weight and temperature. And so we need an initial weight for the fish to run these models. We need the temperature of the water that the fish occupies. And we need the energy density of the fish and the prey, because usually these bioenergetics models are done in terms of joules. If we want to convert that to, for example, biomass growth or weight, we need a conversion to be able to change that to grams, for example. So what does this model look like in application? So this is an example of one year of growth using this first bioenergetics model. The solid lines here are different ages of fish. So the first line is age one, or excuse me, age zero, age one, age two. 
and the different symbols that you see are actual data that was observed in the field. And so you can see that this first model uh, matches the observed data pretty well, right? This is a good tool for uh, uh, modeling uh, growth, and it matches what we observe. Another application is instead of modeling over a growing season or one year, you can model growth over the entire fish's life. And so this is eight years of a fish's life. You can see age and days on the x-axis, uh, 3,500 days of the fish's life, and you can model how it changes in weight. And this is uh, great because it's, we wouldn't be able to go out and track the same herring over its entire life uh, in situ and try to figure out how it grows. So this is a, a, a great tool to try to uh, answer questions like that. And so well, what's an ecological application of this model? Well, uh, you can see here, uh, Arrhenius and Hansen uh, used this first bioenergetics model to try to figure out how, uh, m how much zooplankton herring consumed in the Baltic Sea. And as you can see, uh, the month is on the x-axis, the consumption in tons uh, on the y-axis, and uh, there's quite a bit of consumption. And you can also show it like this, where you have bro it broken down into different age classes, which are also represented by the different patterns in the bars. And uh, what's really important to notice is that here, uh, in the peak consumption periods, the consumption is dominated by age zero herring. And so these are herring that are not larvae anymore, they're post-metamorphosis, but um, they, uh, they're still less than a year old. Uh, and so, uh, young of your herring account for one third of the total consumption of all, or of all zooplankton production in the Baltic Sea based on this old model. And that's a, a, a pretty important thing uh, if it's true. And so is this correct? Because the model wasn't tuned specifically for age zero fish. And as you can imagine, uh, young fish probably have a different, meta excuse me, different metabolism, behave a little bit differently than adult fish. And luckily, the second bioenergetics model, Arrhenius 1998, also from Stockholm University, uh, tried to look at this very question. He tried to specialize the model to age zero herring. So he made some small changes to parameters in consumption and metabolism, um, some larger changes to swimming speed. All these different changes in parameters were based on uh, uh, new literature values, new experiments that were done. Um, but one of the biggest changes he made was that the feeding period was changed to only during daylight hours. So he uh, included in the model herring only feed when the sun is up. And this is supported by field observations uh, and, and things of that sort. Uh, herring only feed when the sun's up. When the sun goes down, um, they're pretty, uh, uh, they don't eat as much, their stomach's empty. So comparing the old model, Rudstam uh, model, in the open blue circles to the new model uh, in black squares, you have the field, uh, field data on the x-axis of consumption, the modeled predictions of consumption on the y-axis, and the solid black lines, the one-to-one -one relationship. You can see that the Rudstam model, the old model that wasn't made specifically for age zero herring, overestimated consumption of age zero herring. And this new model, the Rudstam model, brought it back down towards uh, what's observed in the field. And not only did it make that change, but by adding in the variable feeding period, um, you can see the non-variable uh, model had a peak in feeding around September, uh, earlier in the season. You see a temporal shift uh, in the uh, period of max consumption when you add in this variable feeding period. Uh, and uh, it's cool to see that the area under the curve remains relatively similar. So the overall, uh, the overall amount of food that they're consuming doesn't really change. It's just a temporal shift. And so does this matter? Well, uh, when we're trying to use these models to look at ecosystems, uh, we want them to represent the ecosystem as best as possible. And so some more field data right outside the ASCO area from a, a large roast sandpaper. These names are all pretty similar. It's the same group of people that's all working on this stuff. Um, but you have copepod production in the shaded areas and herring consumption in the black bars. And you can see that the peak in consumption in October matches the peak in herring consumption that's naturally observed. So this is good. So moving on, this is in 1998. Here we are almost 25 years later. And I want to bring attention to this quote from Dr. James Kitchell who is one of the fathers of fish bioenergetics modeling. And right, these previous two models weren't wrong um, based on the mass balance equation, which we know must be right due to thermodynamics. Uh, they were technically correct. But we can improve these models based on our knowledge of new parameters uh, and the quality of the data that we use to feed these models. So 20, almost 25 years later, we decided to revisit these models and take a look at them. So. What we did was, instead of modeling consumption, 
we decided to base our consumption on uh, ambient zooplankton densities and a functional response, so actual data from the environment. So what is a functional response? Well, it's basically a change in uh, prey consumption uh, based on the density that the prey is found. And so there's three different types of responses, type one, type two, type three, as you can see there. Uh, and luckily for us, the uh, functional response of herring consumption with zooplankton around the ASCO area was already done. Arrhenius and Hansen uh, did it. Uh, again, similar na uh, same names. And uh, you can see herring have a type two functional response, which means they're, excuse me, limited by uh, how quickly they can digest prey. Um, and so, instead of modeling the consumption, we used uh, observed consumption, and we took some uh, field data of herring growth, uh, pretty large sample size, um, and we took this line of best fit here, uh, converted it into a wet weight, and then we compared the old Arrhenius model with our functional response to how well it represents this in situ growth that we observed. And not great. So we knew that there are some discrepancies between the model. It's not really predicting our observed data that well. We needed to update it a little bit. So we decided to make some changes and see if we can make this model a little bit better. And what we did was we focused our, uh, our changes on the respiration parameters, uh, as these parameters are uh, 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 what kind of drive the model. The model is most sensitive to these different parameters. And so uh, we changed a few metabolism parameters based on the data we found in the literature uh, for herring. These are all uh, values were changed between known values. Uh, but one of the bigger changes we made was with swimming speed. And so uh, in the second model, the Arrhenius model, this activity multiplier, uh, also known as the swimming speed, um, only increased basal respiration by 9 to 16 percent, when usually uh, in other fish models, uh, this activity multiplier usually doubles the respiration or more. It's usually what's typical. So what we did was we applied an activity multiplier of two during the day. Um, and we didn't just pull this number out of thin air. It's not like we just decided to slap, oh, we're going to multiply this by two. Uh, it's a well-known value. It's the, the, the Winberg multiplier. Um, it's used in bioenergetics models uh, for fish uh, since they, they were begun. Um, and at nighttime, uh, we change this multiplier to one. And so going on this variable feeding period idea, uh, if the fish aren't feeding at night, they're probably not swimming as fast. They're probably not using as much energy. And this is supported by uh, field experiments with herring. So when we make these changes, does our model perform better? And the answer is yes. You can see uh, our model here uh, in the yellow matches much more uh, uh, well with the observed field data than uh, the Arrhenius model when we combine it with the, with the functional response. And so, the bigger picture, what does this all mean for the Baltic Sea? How can we use these tools? Well, here we have the three different models plotted here. Um, the first model, Rudstam, the Arrhenius model, and our model down here. And you can see that our model overall uh, has a lower total consumption of energy over this, this simulation, this specifically for age zero herring. And so that's why this simulation is only run through these days, because uh, herring uh, usually metamorphose around this time of the year. And so that's why the time period is like this. But you can see our model predicts uh, lower consumption. And so, OK, well, what does that mean? It doesn't really mean that much. Um, well, you can extrapolate that out into uh, the bigger picture for the whole Baltic ecosystem. And so with the old Arrhenius model, 32% of the entire zooplankton production was predicted to be consumed by age zero herring. This isn't all herring, this is age zero herring. With our model, 25%. And so it dropped a little bit, but it still reinforces the idea that herring, specifically age zero herring, are very important to the Baltic ecosystem. And what's really cool about these models is you can use them for, for estimates like this, right? You can uh, use these models uh, to f estimate growth and consumption for an entire ecosystem. Uh, you can use these models to uh, predict how much waste is being released into the environment. And this isn't only specific to herring. You can have bioenergetics models for basically anything, other fish too. And so they really are a great tool. So. Moral of the story is it's important to update these models um, with new and higher quality data because the better quality data you feed it, the better you parameterize these models, the better they perform, and the better they reflect uh, what's actually happening in the ecosystem. And it's important because small changes have a large impact. And uh, all in all, that e these bioenergetics models are a very 
powerful tool on the individual level to investigate questions of individual herring and also on the population level for herring all across the Baltic Sea. So thank you for listening.